Thank you for joining us tonight for our virtual program, Meadows and Monarchs, a discussion on pollinators with Victor DeMassey. My name is Kayla Del Biondo, and I am coordinator of adult programming and outreach at New Canaan Library. And it has been our pleasure to partner with the New Canaan Land Trust to organize tonight's lecture for our community. In June 2019, New Canaan officially partnered and initiated a townwide pollinator pathway. The goal is to continue the corridors of pollinator friendly properties with private and public land. Residents are encouraged to be on the pathway and sign up their own pollinator friendly property on pollinator-pathway.org. So if you're interested tonight after tonight's program, we encourage everyone to visit pollinator-pathway or pollinator-pathway.org and you can navigate to Connecticut Pathways and then New Canaan to learn more and uh, consider registering your property. A few Zoom housekeeping um, tips before we get into tonight's program. Um, we're using Zoom webinar, so everyone, we're expecting a big crowd tonight and everyone's microphone and cameras will be disabled, but we encourage you to ask questions through the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, Victor is generous with his time and he's gonna be answering a few audience questions at the end. So please put those in the Q&A feature. You'll also see that we're using the live transcript feature of Zoom for accessibility reasons. So as we speak, you'll be seeing that uh, those closed captions, but if that is not something that you wanna be seeing, you can hover over where it says live transcript and hide those subtitles. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron Leffland, Executive Director at the Land Trust. Thanks Kayla and thanks everybody for joining us. It looks like we have just under 100 folks tuned in right now and hopefully a few more joining us maybe a few minutes late. Um, as Kayla mentioned, we're, we're thrilled to bring Victor to the audience tonight. Um, it's just so incredibly relevant as, as spring is emerging. We're starting to see um, our plants come back and, and our, our, our butterflies and other insects emerging. Um, so great time of year to start learning a little bit about what's out there, how we can better manage for them and promote habitat. Um, and I think Kayla did a really great job of explaining sort of what the pollinator pathway in Connecticut or in New Canaan is, um, as well as more broadly. Uh, the, the Land Trust is a really proud partner to be on the New Canaan pollinator pathway. Uh, we own just under 350 acres and have another 50 acres under conservation easement, and that's spread out across 65 or so different parcels around town. Um, so we're actually one of the largest private landowners in town, but as much land as we own, that only achieves so much. And part of what our mission is, is to sort of transfer our, our conservation ethic and our land stewardship ethic to private property, because that's the only way we can really maximize our impact across the entirety of New Canaan. So we'd encourage you to, to, to listen tonight, learn tonight, also use some of the resources that are available on the Pollinator Pathway website that Kayla mentioned. And if, if you're interested, register your property and, and help us grow the network. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Victor. Victor DeMassey is an extremely active member of the Pollinator Pathway. Uh, he was a wetlands conservation officer in his hometown of Reading for more than 20 years, and is presently a curatorial affiliate at the Old Peabody Museum of Natural History in New Haven. He busies himself with preserving open space in town and preserving butterflies at the museum. His field work with butterflies contributed almost a thousand citations to the recently published Connecticut Butterfly Atlas, uh, his contributed articles to scientific publications and his uh, mark recapture studies with swallowtail butterflies was recently cited in the book Swallowtails of the Americas. Uh, during the pandemic, he's doing a pollinator survey for two meadows in Reading, Connecticut, and was recently featured in a natural history magazine with a sort of a special feature about the pollinator pathway program. Recently, butterfly trips with his spouse, Roanna, a photographer, have been, uh, they've been several times to the Amazon forest. Uh, in Guyana, Nicaragua, and do yearly studies in the Montaigne, California, uh, assessing the impacts of climate change on the fauna there. And so with that, I'm pleased to welcome Victor and take it away. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, very flattering. And, um, you know, years ago, we had the International uh, Congress of Lepidoptery, Lepidoptery is the study of butterflies, came to New Haven, we were hosting it. And I was asked to uh, lead a uh, field trip. And, uh, you know, these were people from all over the world came for this event and they had been to the most outstanding places you could imagine for butterflies. So with some trepidation, I took them around for about uh, four or five hours to my favorite meadows in Reading. And uh, at the end of the day, when I was uh, returning them, uh, I asked them, I said, well, well what did you... Uh, think of our, you know, fauna not being anything like the Amazon or anything, of course. 
And I was very surprised to hear, I never realized that Connecticut was so beautiful. And a number of other people said that in the, in the field trip. So uh, made me feel uh, good about our own little place and my backyard where we're going to visit today. Uh, now, uh, we're going to talk about pollinators along the way, a lot of insect stuff. So let's get started here. Here's the pollinator pathway logo. And uh, we are trying to increase the places where pollinators live. Uh, now, you know, in order for you to listen to me, I have to establish uh, some authority. So I'm going to try to do that here with this uh, guy here from uh, back in old England when the real in study of insects began and uh, people would go out and catch the insects and make collections. And they were, well, just to remind you, remember the uh, song Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. He stuck a feather in his hat and what did he call it? Macaroni. Well, that's what these guys were, macaronis out of, uh, and, and incidentally, women were also involved in this endeavor, catching these insects and making collections. Uh, they were macaronis, which compares them to the Italians who were considered, uh, you know, quite a, quite a wild bunch of people by the English who often traveled there for their vacations, even back in the 1700s. So fast forward, and we have an, also an Italian American and uh, still collecting chasing butterflies around with the net. So this is the modern macaroni. And uh, with that, I hope that you uh, will listen to what I have to say with my authority. My spouse and I have been all over the world uh, adding specimens and studying butterflies. We've added about 30,000 specimens to the Yale Peabody Museum collection, which is one of the largest collections in the world. We've seen some fun things along the way. Here we're crossing the active volcano on Montserrat, which is uh, can be quite uh, detrimental to uh, aircraft. But after going to Africa, South America, all across North America, I have found my backyard to be just as good, just as much fun as any place. And that's very similar to your background, backyard in uh, New Canaan. And that's where we're going to take you today to the backyard. And here's what my backyard looks like. It's about a two acre site. Here's my lovely spouse out there. And this is in um, time for uh, goldenrod. So this is late summer. This place is really quite a, a nice, uh, typical Connecticut uh, field, if you want to call it that. In the 45 years that we've lived there, uh, we have managed to document about half the state fauna of butterflies of them only appear irregularly, not every year. For instance, in the far up-hand corner is the pipevine swallowtail. Very rare butterfly in Connecticut. We found one in Reading in the 45 years that I've been here, but it still counts as being registered. In the middle, we have the monarch, and below that, you can see the viceroy tiger swallowtail, the big yellow and black one. These are familiar bugs to anyone who goes outside in our state. Now, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start with uh, pollination and understanding pollination. And pollination is where uh, this, the sperm is transferred to the egg uh, and its pollen is transferred to the stigma. It's basically the same process of uh, fertilization of eggs. And many insects and other agents are involved in this process. Now, there's also pollination by wind, uh, and that is things like the oak trees, which are out now, and you pollen sufferers know this well enough. Uh, the oak trees uh, do not uh, use insects to pollinate. They just put their uh, pollen on the wind, wind, and it's blown around, and hopefully we'll find the uh, female oak flower. Uh, recently, uh, new studies have indicated that actually insects are possibly involved in oak tree pollination to some degree. So that's kind of a real hot new uh, thing that was uh, always thought it was just wind pollination. Uh, you know, the pollen season is upon us. Uh, we get uh, pollen uh, from all over the place. This is uh, typical pollen, heavy pollen years. Uh, in I leave my car out in Reading and often it has a very thick uh, 
you, you know, kind of sticky film of this uh, pollen that is blown around on the wind. Now, this is not to confuse with dispersal. This is things like the dandelion and their seeds are dispersed by the wind. Uh, it's different than pollination by the wind. Okay, so get those things clear. Okay, don't get those mixed up. Now with the non-wind uh, pollination, we have the insects. This is our honeybee. And you can see the uh, honeybee has specialized uh, uh, organs for transferring pollen between flowers. And here, this honeybee is just full of uh, pollen. And uh, they also take nectar. And the plants use these to entice these insects to help them uh, carry out their fertilization. Here is a group of different elements that we find in our environment, different animals. And the, the answer I'm looking for is which ones of these are pollinators? And that's something you can uh, talk about or think about for a minute. And I'm going to answer it for you. These are actually all pollinating agents in our environment uh, and uh, I can't see my, okay, uh, beetles, bats, mosquitoes. These are all things we found uh, this year when we were doing a pollinator survey in uh, Redding, Connecticut. So this is what pollination nation looks like. About 25% of our plants are pollinated by the wind, passive, they do not use insects or anything. And about 75% of our plants are, um, you know, pollinated by some kind of agent, such as a bird, an insect, mostly we think of insects, but there's a lot of other things going on as far as uh, pollinating agents. And uh, think about if you remove all these pollinating agents from our environment, you're going to lose 75% of the plants that we have uh, will eventually just wink out because they will not be reproducing. So the health of the pollinating nation is a very important fact to us and one that we seemingly ignored uh, to our own uh, demise up till recently. Uh, here we are at my house in Reading up on the side and we got a wonderful patch of uh, a red Menard bee bomb going here. And years ago, uh, when I was a refugee from Stanford, when I was first getting married, a lot of us were coming up to places like Reading where the rents were or, or houses were a lot cheaper. And Marilyn Sloper, a very well-known local uh, uh, real estate agent, took me around looking at houses all day where I was going to bring my new bride from California. And uh, she was getting quite exasperated with me. And finally, she said to me, well, I have one house. It's a real dog, but it just might be what you'd like. And uh, I drove up the driveway to this Victorian period, 1874 house, and saw that field in the back. And I've been here ever since. Uh, found rare insects here and many, many uh, wonderful pollinating uh, experiences. Now, some of the pollinators uh, we'll run into are things like uh, hummingbirds and they're favoring uh, a lot of these red flowers like the Menarda we were just looking at and also uh, um, uh, Lobelia, uh, absolutely beautiful flower, once very common in Connecticut, but heavily picked uh, for display. So we're trying to bring uh, cardinal flowers back. Uh, if you're planting, you should definitely consider uh, getting some native cardinal flowers and they're absolutely uh, uh, wonderful uh, meadow plants. One of the butterflies that really favors, and I found this out in my studies, the black spice bush swallowtail, which comes uh, later in the summer, uh, really favors the red flowers such as the bee balm, and the uh, cardinal flower. And uh, in my research, I found that as soon as the uh, cardinal flower blossoms in, in late summer, all the, all the uh, spice bush swallowtails go there to do the, do the uh, find their nectar. Now, one of the things we're really promoting as part of our uh, pollinator effort are the milkweeds. And um, we'll talk about milkweeds in relationship to monarch butterflies a little later. But milkweeds are great uh, sources for uh, pollinators. And if you have some milkweeds in your yard, you're going to find that bees and stuff and other pollinators are regularly uh, visiting it. Uh, couldn't make a better 
stab at adding some pollinating uh, flowers. We have been distributing, my daughter has been distributing four species of milkweeds that we have here in our meadow. And uh, if there's anybody in the audience who's interested, you can contact me uh, and uh, we are providing the seeds free or with a little, uh, little stipend for uh, uh, mailing. But we have the common milkweed. We have the swamp milkweed, which we again are providing seeds for. This is not such a common uh, milkweed plant. We are providing uh, purple milkweed. Here it is. This is, we have some purple milkweeds, which are very rare in Connecticut, but we have a pretty good supply of the seeds. So if you're a, a really uh, fairly interested gardener and can handle something like this, uh, we can get you some purple milkweed seeds. You're not a real man or woman until you grow your own purple milkweed, as far as I'm concerned. Here is, uh, here we are in the meadow now, uh, with the pandemic last year, uh, we, we still forged ahead with our field work. W wonderfully, there's no virus out in the uh, meadow. And this is a Sammy Riccio. She's a recent uh, college graduate and very fine naturalist, uh, specializing in bees. She's a beekeeper and stuff. And she helped out. She did the Highstead Arboretum uh, Meadow in Reading, if any of you know that. Uh, they, they are promoting wildflowers and, and wild plants. And this is a Sammy in the field. And here I am with my youngest, my young understudy, Lucas Curis, who is, uh, he's a 13 year old uh, boy who is really phenomenally interested in insects. So we uh, spent all summer, he, he, he uh, donated, he procured over 400 specimens for this collection of pollinators that we made. Uh, we, we got over 2000, pollinating uh, insects that is going to the Yale Peabody Museum. Now, you know, I mean, people ask the obvious question, if you like pollinators so much, why are you murdering everyone you see? And uh, the point is, is that no one has ever really done just a study of a particular meadow to see how many pollinators are there over the season in Connecticut. They've done studies like that elsewhere, but I thought it was time for Connecticut to have one. So. We uh, did a marvelous uh, pollinator study last season, and those specimens are in preparation right now and will be going to state biologists and stuff for identification uh, shortly. One of the things we found uh, pollinating, we found hawk moths. These are really terrific. You might see these moths in your garden. Uh, a lot of people think they're some kind of hummingbird. They are called hummingbird moths. There's five species in Connecticut. They're absolutely wonderful. And if you're growing something like a red Minarda, this is when you know you're doing a good job when they start showing up. They like the deep, the flowers that have a really deep uh, corolla. Other things you might find are bumblebees. And bumblebees are kind of our main uh, locomotive pulling the pollinating wagon at the time. Uh, unfortunately, a number of bumblebees have disappeared from our state in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But some of them, like the common bumblebee, are doing pretty well. And if you if you enhance your pollinating capacity, you're going to definitely get uh, the common bumblebee. This is the brown, uh, the rusty bumblebee, which I think is now extirpated from the state of Connecticut. We did not find it on our survey. Here's another uh, a bumblebee, uh, uh, another type of bee, not not a bumblebee. I'm sorry. Uh, but it looks like a bumblebee. So there's, there's a bunch of things out there you might think are bumblebees, but they're really other families of bees. There's a bunch of families of bees. Here we see the bumblebee loaded with pollen. They have special pollen uh, uh, gathering apparatus on their legs and stuff. So they're, uh, they make a living uh, doing this. And along the way, they enhance the uh, replication and reproduction of our flowers and plants uh, that would otherwise not happen. Now, we're going to talk about garden, and we're going to, uh, we used to call this a butterfly garden, but let's just call it a pollinator garden. And uh, here is a beautiful backyard garden in a very nice house in Fairfield County. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I had a customer who was not this customer, but another customer who had the most beautiful garden. And when I was uh, working there, she uh, spent every 
day out in her garden, but she wanted to know why she didn't have any butterflies in her garden. And I, I looked in her garage and uh, there it was on the shelf, uh, you know, because she was basically drenching uh, the place with uh, pesticides. And uh, uh, along with butterflies, she was really making it a non-place for all uh, pollinating insects. So we're going to talk really, uh, butterfly gardening is basically a form of landscape management. First of all, we have to remember, we're going to go back to high school or grade school or wherever you learn this and you probably forgot it. We're going to talk about how butterflies go through their life cycle. And the first thing we have at the top is you have the um, eggs. The butterflies lay their eggs. The eggs of each butterfly are very distinctive. The butterfly eggs hatch into a uh, caterpillar and the caterpillars feed on specific plants like the monarch butterflies. Their caterpillars feed only on milkweed. They do not feed on anything else. Down below, you have the chrysalis and uh, that's when the butterfly, the caterpillar is gonna prepare to change into a butterfly. And on the left-hand side, you have the adult butterfly whose main reason is to mate and lay eggs. And the butterfly comes out fully formed. People ask me, are butterflies, little ones gonna get big? No, they're not. They are that size. When they come out, they're not gonna get any bigger. Their main thing is to reproduce. And things like the tiger swallowtail, the yellow and back, black tiger swallowtail, which I marked with capture study, I determined that they probably, it's rare for one to live longer than a week. These things are food for the birds and the birds are out looking for them, especially the big swallowtails. They're a really nice food package. Now, let's take a look at how this goes. The eggs are uh, distinctive and uh, you can tell the species of butterfly by its eggs and the way they lay their eggs. Here is a, a pile of um, uh, question mark butterfly eggs, uh, really beautiful when they're photographed at this uh, scale. And uh, one of the real fun things about working at the Peabody, you know, being at the Peabody Museum over the years is what goes on there. One day uh, they were cleaning off dinosaur bones uh, and uh, they took the sand and the stuff they scraped off and they put it under a friend of mine, Larry Gall, who's the head of the department there, the entomology department, put it under an electron microscope and found eggs of Catocala moths, underwing moths, 60 million years old. So it was just really an exciting moment to be there when something like that is happening. And, uh, you know, that is, I think that stands as the late, the longest ago known insect eggs. The previous to that, the longest known were like a few thousand years. So he made a big jump going uh, back to 60 million years to the uh, Cretaceous period. So uh, this is a caterpillar, and uh, this is the caterpillar of the rare pipeline swallowtail. This swallowtail feeds, was the, the butterfly of this, uh, the uh, 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 pipeline swallowtail was once fairly common in Connecticut because the plant, Dutchman's pipe, that it feeds on was very popular in Victorian times as a porch uh, planting. They would plant it near porches and it would vine up the trellises and stuff and the pipe vines would come along and feed on it. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I got a bunch of plants and planted them in my uh, meadow uh, and they were growing for about 10 years. And every year I was hoping some pipe vine would show up and lay some eggs on it. And, uh, you know, it, I, every year I'd go out and I'd check and I'd check and I'd check. And then one day I was given a butterfly walk on my property and this little brat, 10 years old, goes up and says, look, there's over a hundred caterpillars and he and that's the first time and the only time I saw caterpillars and there was like a hundred tons of them we counted over a hundred and I was just so uh burned that it took this little kid found them and I had never been able to see them so lepidoptery is not all fun some tough moments now here is the the monarch uh it's coming out of its chrysalis it has uh, gone through metamorphosis and uh you know I, I'll just tell you think about this if you were sent from Mars or someplace like that, and you were told to study life on Earth, 
okay? Would you ever connect that a caterpillar would be related to a butterfly? They are such dissimilar things. Metamorphosis, where the caterpillar changes into the butterfly, is to me the most unbelievable process in the natural world. It beats anything. And, uh, you know, this, this process, uh, you can actually see this by raising monarchs. You'll see them change uh, right before your eye. Uh, this is the close of that monarch was coming out of different. This is a tiger swallowtail chrysalis. And interestingly enough, these chrysalises can be colored to fit with their environment. It could be leaf green if it was stuck between a bunch of leaves. Here it's brown to uh, mimic the uh, stick. So a uh, wonderful uh, uh, cryptic situations that these uh, butterflies can, can do. And here it is, the adult butterfly. This is the giant swallowtail, a recent uh, arrival in our state. Uh, giant swallowtails is, is an interesting aspect. Uh, you know, people ask me, is climate change getting rid of a lot of butterflies? Well, it's getting rid of some, but it's bringing others. So our fauna is to some degree stable between departures and arrivals. And this is a spectacular recent arrival. This is a large butterfly, larger than the tiger, if you're familiar with that bug. And this goes all the way down into uh, South America. We've seen it commonly uh, when we were in the Amazon and in the mountains in Ecuador and stuff. And this butterfly, what it does, it feeds on a plant called uh, uh, prickly ash. And the prickly ash, uh, it, it, it will not, the caterpillars will not eat anything but prickly ash. Now, prickly ash is a plant that is very sensitive to frost uh, damage. And the, in order to survive in Connecticut, this butterfly comes out in the spring, lays eggs. They develop into adults in like July. Those ones lay eggs again and they develop into adults by September, and then they will become chrysalises and spend the winter as chrysalises. Now, what has happened in recent years, because we have much later frosts, the prickly ash stays turgid, stays green until late in the season. As soon as you have a frost, prickly ash just turns to mush and, and just droops. So the caterpillars will starve to death. So these caterpillars that need two uh, rounds of life cycle are now hanging out in Connecticut because they're getting a uh, very late um, uh, frosts. If we have a typical frost or the frost like we used to have in late September, early October, it'll wipe out the food plant and uh, this butterfly will again disappear from Connecticut. It did, uh, the giant swallowtail did have a session in Connecticut in the 1950s where population persisted in central Connecticut in a number of warm years. And also back at the turn of the century when it was reported from uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, not the turn of this last century, but uh, you know, 1900 and stuff like that. So the Starred brothers, uh, avid collectors in Greenwich uh, were reporting giant swallowtails from there. So really interesting if you get to see one. I have not seen one in the state yet. So I'm really jealous of the people that have seen them. Uh, so here we are, uh, we're in uh, French Guiana going into the Amazon. And one of the things that makes the Amazon such a great place for butterflies is that there are many, many different species of plants. The diversity is overwhelming. In fact, surveys they've done in this area of French Guiana, they could not find the same species of tree twice on an acre of land. Every time, I mean, the, the chance of finding the same tree, species of tree, you have to look over a, a broad area. Think of that as a comparison to our forest here. You take a walk and an acre of land has almost all birch or birch and maple and stuff like that. So the diversity is tremendous. And since each caterpillar favors different food plants, okay, you're going to get a great diversity of, uh, of uh, butterflies there. And, you know, this is where uh, butterfly gardeners and regular gardeners part company. I uh, go out in my field and I see this on a plant and I'm looking to see what caterpillars feeding on this. And I'm all excited that I got a new find. Uh, another person uh, goes out and they're, uh, let's see here, went the wrong way. Oh, oh, 
Can I go back? How do I go back? No, no word here. Okay. Uh, oh, he's thing. I wanted to go back. I missed it. Using your keyboard arrows, Victor? Yeah, I see it. I see it. Hold on. I got it. I never did this before. Excellent. No worries. Okay. okay. Uh, so anyway, I'm excited when I find, uh, you know, this because I got something new feeding on it. I'm not reaching for my, uh, you know, roundup or anything like that. So let's see. Uh, let's study a little more about the butterfly biology because this is an important aspect. Here's a, here's a butterfly. You might think this is the cabbage white that you see uh, in your garden eating your broccoli and uh, other members of the uh, cabbage family. Uh, these butterflies, this is the West Virginia white. It was a native white butterfly to Connecticut that occurred in deep forested areas where a, uh, a plant that is related to the cabbage family, although you would never guess it was a cabbage family plant, but it's related to the cabbage family and it was feeding on these cabbages that um, toothwort that occur on these kind of uh, deep forested areas where you find maple trees and kind of wet ground and stuff like that. These butterflies fly in early April to late April, close to the ground on warm days, looking for their tooth wart to put an egg down on. They're very distinctive if you happen to know where colonies are out in the forest. Now, here's the caterpillar. It's happily eating on tooth wart. Generally, it won't eat anything else but uh, it loves that tooth wart. And here comes something from Central Asia. This is the garlic mustard, which we're all gonna be seeing on our little wood lots uh, soon enough. And the garlic mustard is also a member of the cabbage family. Now, what happens, unfortunately, is the cabbage butterfly, the West Virginia white butterfly, which is uh, living in these forested areas, finds this garlic mustard and lays an egg on it and the caterpillars starve because they cannot eat garlic mustard. When the female comes along, she scratches the leaf and she gets the same chemical signals that uh, other members of the cabbage family would give her that this is the right plant to put an egg on, but it's not. Now my spot in Redding, I had a wonderful uh, colony of West Virginia whites for many years. And then they were sanding the roads a lot and the sand would wash off the roads into the stream and made a sandbar in the middle of a really deep forest where my West Virginia white colony was living. Soon enough, there's garlic mustard growing on that little sandbar. And within a few years, the uh, West Virginia white uh, disappeared. Now I didn't see them lay their eggs on the wrong plant, uh, but we know this from other places where West Virginia white has declined that this is a process is that is in work that is working uh, on our native species, uh, giving them the wrong cues. And we'll talk about that with the monarch in a minute. This is an important biological aspect. Uh, you're gonna have plenty of uh, garlic mustard uh, invasive plant soon enough. Uh, we're, we spend a lot of our springtime uh, eliminating it from our meadow. Now, uh, we're gonna talk a little about the monarch butterfly and the monarch has been Big in the press, it's very charismatic. Uh, problems that the monarch has is not unusual to our insect fauna in general. So, uh, you know, there's, there's wider lessons to be learned by studying the monarch, but it is so spectacular that uh, we're gonna study why exactly uh, this butterfly is uh, broken to some degree. Now, here's what the monarchs do. Look at the uh, yellow, uh, lines in the springtime monarchs migrate from central mexico all the monarchs from the east east of the rocky mountains go to one place in mexico which is about a hundred acre area in the mountain range in the middle of uh, mexico and if you've ever seen the pictures there's millions of monarchs hanging from trees uh when i was a kid it was estimated to be 600 uh, uh six six billion monarchs now it's about 500 million something like that and uh they migrate north in the spring when it gets warm enough they're in this forest there called the transverse uh, forest in mexico and it's a, a thick uh fir tree forest where it never really quite freezes so the monarchs the monarchs all go there and they 
hang out for the winter where they go into a torpor and uh, uh, just above freezing. If for any reason they freeze, they die, but they just stay a few degrees above freezing. In the spring, when it warms up a little bit, they start, they mate and they start to uh, come north. The first batch of flying north will reach someplace like southern uh, Texas and uh, Georgia and stuff, and they will lay eggs, which in six weeks will develop into caterpillars, caterpillars will develop into butterflies, and they will continue their migration north. We see them in Connecticut generally around May 10th, they start to arrive, and they're looking for milkweed that you're going to plant in your backyard when you get some seeds from me, uh, and they... Uh, they, they, they continue their, their migration all the way up to as far as Prince Edward Islands and Quebec. Now, come September, all the monarchs that have been breeding all along the eastern seaboard from Texas up to, um, up to uh, Canada, turn around and go back to central Mexico. How do they know to get there? I mean, you bird watchers, you talk it big about bird migration. I mean, think about this. This is... This is six generations of memory go through these species to remember where to return. It's not one bird flying up from Patagonia and then flying back in the fall. This, they've carried the memory of this migration north, 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 and then south all of a sudden. And uh, used to be not so much anymore, but you still in nice, beautiful day in September or something, go out and lay on your lawn and look up and you'll see the little orange things way up in the sky migrating south. So this is the monarch's deal. Out west is a separate monarch population that uh, goes to the uh, west coast to uh, spend the winter. Places like Pacific Grove, which has a monarch sanctuary, there's like 23 spots along the uh, California coast that have monarchs uh, in the winter uh, uh, staying there. Wonderful uh, experience with that. So let's see what's happening. Okay, here's the monarchs migrating to Mexico in the fall. Okay. And, you know, the monarch is, often I do butterfly walks uh, before this pandemic came along. I used to do uh, butterfly walks for different land trusts. And uh, sometimes I catch a monarch and I just take the monarch and crush it in my hands and everybody's like shocked you know and, and then i open my hand and the monarch is up and flows away flies away those monarchs are tough they are really really tough you don't fly from prince edward islands to central mexico if you're a big baby uh, i mean these things are like rubber you can step on them they'll get up and fly amazing so anything that anybody that thinks that butterflies are really uh delicate are not this one and as far as their wings are concerned, and you can't touch butterfly wings, I hear that all the time. Uh, my wife and I were out in the Cal, Cal Academy of Sciences. They've built a wonderful tropical uh, uh, environment inside the museum and with huge blue morpho butterflies. And, and it has a circular walkway around it that gradually descends. And this female morpho had flown out to the walkway and was sitting in the middle of the walkway. And there was like, 30 people just like shocked that the butterfly was there. My wife just pushed her way through the crowd and picked up the butterfly and, oh, you can't do that. You can't touch a butterfly. And she just, yeah, watch. And she just took the female and threw her back into the display where the female flew up to a tree and was sitting happily hours later. So uh, you can touch them. Uh, I'm not recommending you go out and smush every butterfly you find, but uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about what uh, butterflies can do. Now here is the monarch caterpillar. It's a very obvious caterpillar. And uh, these things, when they're full grown, going around on milkweeds, which they only feed on milkweeds, they are really poisonous. They can look like this. They can be in full display because nobody's gonna eat this thing. Birds that have been fed, monarch adults or monarch caterpillars get very sick and vomit and will never touch one again. Why? In the milkweeds, there's a very poisonous uh, uh, substance called pyrazidine alkaloid. It was used in colonial times as a heart treatment. It's a very strong, uh, you know, folk medicine, poison. Uh, you eat enough of it, it's going to kill you. Uh, and that much. And these caterpillars, and they sequester. 
they take that poison and make it part of their own tissue. So they, uh, they get protection from predators such as birds that would uh, eat them, have them for dinner. And here is one of their favorite milkweeds, the butterfly up oh, my butter. My, I'm sorry, my internet sounds like it's unstable. I'm hoping you guys aren't going to lose me. Um, so I have here, uh, this is butterfly weed. And uh, this is uh, Aslepius tuberosa, a real favorite of the monarch uh, caterpillars, but also the adults love this. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is, uh, oh, I got to do my thing here. Hold on. I learned how to do this. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little about uh, what is some of the problems harshing monarch life. Okay, here is a favorite uh, in the milkweed family, butterfly weed. Uh, if you have these in your meadow, you're doing something right. Okay, and here from Central Asia is another member of the milkweed family that arrived in the United States some years ago and has spread very rapidly. This is called black swallowwort. If you break the leaves, you get the same little white milk that you uh, get at when you break the leaves on a monarch, uh, on a, a milkweed. That hence the name milkweed, you know. Okay, here's what this plant looks like. It becomes a terrible vine that chokes out meadows and stuff. Uh, I saw the first one in our meadow in 1983. I was all excited, love to see a new plant. And within about two years, uh, it had become something like this, almost a pure stand of black swallowwort. Uh, this is a problem for the monarch butterfly because the monarch, like the uh, West Virginia white, comes along, scrapes the leaf, gets the wrong chemical signal, and puts an egg on it. Uh, the caterpillars hatch out and they starve to death because they can't eat this plant. About 20%, studies done at the University of Rhode Island indicate that about 20% of eggs are laid when black swallow wart is around in force, uh, about 20% of the eggs are laid mistakenly on black swallow wart. So this is a long-term, uh, one of the long-term problems for our monarch populations. Now, uh, University of Rhode Island is has a great program in trying to control these invasive plants. And here uh, next to me, is uh, Lisa Tewksbury, who runs the invasive plant uh, biocontrol. What is a biocontrol? A biocontrol is generally insects, but maybe something else that can naturally control uh, an invasive plant such as black swallowwort. Here's Lisa with her helper, Susan Robinson from the Reading Conservation Commission, and me, uh, Victor DeMassi. And here we have some really nice fresh. You notice not, nothing is eating this plant. One of the big problems that we have with black swallowwort. So Lisa has uh, introduced a moth. They found a moth. They went to central Ukraine and found a moth that eats this plant in its native range. And they brought it to the United States and we're doing controlled releases. They tried it on many different plants. Doesn't eat anything but black swallowwort, which is exactly what we want it to be eating. And here's the caterpillar. And you can see this leaf stem is completely denuded now. I mean, go back to, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm just gonna go back and look at this real quick. There, look at that perfect leaf, right? Here is what that caterpillar does to that thing when it gets going. Uh, the netting you see is this tent that the uh, caterpillars, we released uh, 25, males and 25 female uh, hythena moths, and they laid eggs and these caterpillars uh, developed from the, uh, from the eggs and they ate this stuff. So I don't know what this is, I'm sorry. Okay, this is the moth, Hyphena opulenta. Very, very poorly known uh, moth. Uh, there's only three of them in the British Museum. So that's, the British Museum has everything. So shows you how poorly this uh, species is known, but it just loves black swallowworts. Now, uh, Lisa at the University of Rhode Island is, uh, uh, is she's rearing these things in mass and releasing them around our meadows to try to control black swallowwort. Okay, I'm gonna just stop for one second and have a drink of water.
And, you know, the invasive species are impacting our uh, pollinator uh, crowd. Here is a very uh, beautiful uh, butterfly, Harris's checker spot, that was once uh, uh, in our meadow. We haven't seen it for about 40 years, 30, 30, 40 years. And the same thing has happened. The uh, food plant has disappeared. Here's Phragmites. This is, uh, we call this the DOT flower. Wherever the DOT makes a, Department of Transportation makes a small disturbance along the road, Phragmites gets in and it will eventually form a choking mass in a wetland. Uh, this plant here is native to the delta of the Danube, where it's a valuable plant in making thatched roofs. So if you're thatching your roof down in New Canaan these days, uh, there's plenty of Phragmites around uh, for free. Uh, here is purple loose strife, absolutely beautiful plant that was introduced as a garden plant and has gotten loose and uh, you'll see meadows, uh, wet meadows completely choked uh, with this plant. It doesn't have any caterpillars to feed on it. It's, it's a very limited uh, biological value for our native uh, fauna. And uh, we are trying to control this by the release, the biocontrol release of several uh, beetles that feed on it. Uh, so let's see here. Now, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we're talking about the uh, monarch and it's being poisonous and stuff. And this is, this is a great biologist, um, uh, Henry Bates. And uh, he, was, he traveled to the Amazon in 1848. So it's just past his 100 year anniversary. And uh, they have published all his notebooks. He made beautiful paintings of all the butterflies he found in the Amazon. And uh, if any of you are artists in that crowd out there, boy, you want to see the work he did with his uh, journals. Absolutely wonderful, which are now published. The public can see it. But uh, Henry Bates was the one who first proposed about these poisonous butterflies, that some butterflies are just poisonous because they're maybe eating poisonous plants. That was his uh, conjecture, but it turned out to be true. And here are some of Bates's uh, journals that have been published, a wonderful uh, thing that, uh, you know, if you get a chance to look at these and you're naturally naturalist oriented. So uh, I wanted to show you just what Bates was looking at. This is a, a collection of butterflies. Uh, now, my wife and I have contributed over 30,000 butterflies to the, uh, and moths to the uh, Yale Peabody Museum. And uh, this is a collection we made in one hour in the Ecuadorian Amazon. I mean, these things are hitting you off of the head down there. This took me 40 years in Connecticut. This is the collection we made, which now belongs to the Peabody Museum, in our meadow. So uh, it shows you the difference. Uh, let's go back and just look at that. Okay, look at this. One hour, 40 years. And so there's quite, this tells you all about biological diversity in the tropics versus uh, what we have here in Connecticut. And in the middle, we have the monarch there and we have the, right below it, the uh, viceroy. Now the relationship between those two butterflies is that the monarch is poisonous because it's feeding on milkweed and the viceroy below it is perfectly tasty. I would eat one, no problem, uh, because it feeds on a different plant. And, but because it looks like the monarch, it receives protection. Birds, predators won't touch it, especially when they've eaten a monarch and had a bad uh, meal experience. Uh, that's been proven through experiments that were done by one of the Yale uh, biologists, Lincoln Brower, who recently passed away and was the great champion of the monarch butterfly. So the uh, Bates, uh, you know, uh, studied this about the poisonous butterflies. And here's the monarch caterpillar in the flesh, not some painting by me that I showed you previously, uh, chomping away at a plant, the milkweed that no one else can eat, really very little. Here is the relationship, the poisonous monarch up top and the tasty mimic down below. The defining characteristic that uh, you can tell is the black lines through the, hind, through the middle of the hind wing uh, is distinctive, okay? Let's see. 
Okay, but this this issue of uh, mimicry. Now, Bates was the first to describe mimicry, where poisonous butterflies are uh, are are mimicked by not poisonous butterflies and receive protection. So uh, here we have this extends into our pollinator world. Here we have uh, let's see. Here we have uh, a fly on the left, perfectly tasty, the hoverfly. And we have a wasp on the right. And uh, you probably know the sting of that. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, a fly uh, mimicking a uh, basically a poisonous or insect that uh, predators are going to stay away from, uh, yellow jacket. Here is the yellow jacket. Here is the fly. The difference, the defining, I mean, I see these things in the field when we're doing our pollinator work. And, you know, like your initial thing is, okay, uh, stay away from it. it, might sting. You can see the antenna. Now the uh, wasp family, which yellow jackets are in, have long segmented antenna. Flies have very short antennas. So really very distinctive characteristics, but you know, this, some predator comes along and it takes a quick look and it gets, and it says, oh, I'm wondering if I should eat that or not. And fly has time to get away because it's uh, successfully mimicking a uh, undesirable uh, prey. The beetles join in on this. Uh, fortunately, this is not such a good example. We have a beetle that is in our meadows here in Connecticut that you would swear is a yellow jacket and it comes out uh, generally in August and stuff. Now, you know, I mean, there's a lot of prejudice against insects. And, uh, you know, as I told my, my gardener customer who was uh, complaining that she would never want bugs in her garden because she hates bugs. Okay. Well, let's look at changing. What can we do to change the attitude of the public? Let's go back to 1900. Now, 1900, if you were a naturalist, you probably would have joined in the great uh, Christmas bird hunt. Uh, every time around Christmas, they went out and murdered every bird they could find. They would shoot and shoot and shoot. And, you know, this picture is from this period of people with hundreds of birds, and they were shooting everything, blue jays, uh, you know, robins, any bird counted. And, you know, look at this thing people doing this in their backyard now uh these zappers bug zappers okay it kills a mosquito but it's also killing everything else that happens to be beneficial you know this is just indiscriminate murder okay and here we have the invasive plant thing going on we have the uh we have the phragmites i was showing you the phragmites before the dot flower this was a wonderful wetland in richfield that over time just became a solid stand of, of Phragmites. So this is what a nice meadow looks like. It's got a lot of diversity in it, a lot of different flowers. Goldenrod is a tremendous, tremendous uh, nectar source. Uh, when we were doing our pollinator surveys last summer, we found the greatest diversity of insects on uh, goldenrod. And, you know, do I need to say any more? I mean, and this is what people are doing People who went to college, went to Harvard, went who, who knows what, they're poisoning, they're drenching our environment. I mean, and not only if, you know, is this a problem with the pollinating insects and the eventual flora, what's going to happen to our flora, but, you know, look what's happening to our children and stuff with the exposure to this uh, type of stuff. We had in Reading, we had to have ball fields where we had to have absolutely green fields, which involved chemicals. So as a conservation commissioner, I, I said, well, what, bring me the list of your chemicals. And the chemical that they were going to use, and they did use on the ball foils, was 245D, which is the defoilant called Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam. They said that it was going to be used properly by licensed operators. Well, within a year of the deployment of the pesticide, the kids went out and played on the fields because they didn't put the uh, signs up to stay off the fields. And some dogs had got the heebie-jeebies and real problems from a pesticide, direct pesticide exposure. So for a bunch of educated people in Connecticut, there's really some stupid things being done. And, you know, just to have this, what does this do? 
So I think that what we really want to do is start to think of meadows as being cool, not lawns being cool. And uh, we got to bring this idea back. And just like we got rid of the Christmas bird hunt by turning it into the Christmas bird count, uh, we got to make people start to appreciate that those bugs in the background are, you know, good. Here's bird houses and stuff. And another thing is the let it grow. Uh, here's my front lawn. Now, I do cut the front. I know what you're saying. Oh, Victor's real lazy. He hates the lawnmower. Well, that is actually true. But uh, I do let the lawn go until uh, mid-July, or not mid-July, maybe mid-June. And uh, this is, we let it grow. And this is what we got. We got a wonderful diversity of flowers right off. Been doing this for some years. And uh, when we did our pollinator survey in our meadow, we were finding the biggest diversity in my front lawn because of these, these uh, flowers. So uh, that was a great surprise to us at the time. And I'm trying to enhance my meadow by... Uh, adding bee houses. This is a bee house, just like I have bird houses for keep more birds around. Here's a bee house. Now, what does a bee house do? Uh, lots of solitary bees, which are our most probably our most important pollinators, the mason bees and the like, use these little tubes to lay their, you know, paralyzed larvae and lay them in there. And uh, so I'm trying to enhance the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, breeding areas for solitary bees. And this is the bee diversity that you can find in an average decent meadow in Connecticut. And we found far more than this. Some really spectacular ones, uh, really spectacular uh, uh, iridescent uh, colors, metallic colors. Now I'm just gonna run through a little bit of my art before I close out here. Uh, I own a business uh, I'm actually a painter uh, for my regular business, Monarch Painting. Metamorphosis is our business. We've painted in Fairfield County for 45 years and actually all over the United States doing historical restoration and uh, fancy mural painting and the like. This was a mural I recently did at our lab at the Peabody Museum to get an idea of what my work looks like. And here I did, this is uh, the Monarch, one of my favorite topics, because my name of my company is Monarch Painting. And uh, this, I put, I threw this up in the lab. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice entry to our uh, collection facility at the Peabody. I teach workshops for children. Uh, this was one at the Bridgefield Center where the children actually made selfies of themselves. These kids have these self, you know, these phones. I'm a ancient boomer, so I grew up without them, but uh, they, I showed them how to, uh, we took selfies and then we made silhouettes of ourselves and silhouettes of my dachshund, uh, Emma. And uh, this is what we did. And the newspaper in Ridgefield came to interview us and the, by the end of the week of uh, painting this, the children knew all about the life cycle of the monarch and they did all the talking to the newspaper. I didn't have to say a word. And let me see, I think I have one or two more things. Oh, here, uh, just want to say that, uh, okay, I'm gonna close here. No, all right. Okay, oh, here's here's one of the mimics of the, uh, of the uh, wasps. This is a tremendous beetle. Okay, okay, I got my, lost my way here. Thank you, Victor, for your presentation. Good night.